Hey, what's up, everybody? Austin Nestle here, the founder and CEO with my man, Mr. Pat Bennett, our head of sales and partnerships, as well as our head and director of uh, coaches and client success, Tom Sylvester. Today, we're talking about how to scale your seven-figure business. What's the difference between one or two million and getting to that about five million mark? What, what can we do to make the leap and do so as efficiently and effectively as possible? No matter if you're a high six or seven-figure business owner, what we are going to share are some of the principles that we've learned now working with hundreds and hundreds of entrepreneurs and small businesses all across the globe to help them turn their business business into a consistent, predictable cash producing machine and doing so in such a way that we take our time back. So what I wanted to start this conversation with is talking about the dip. This is something that we see is like there's different levels that you get to. And as you get to those levels, it's really hard to break through unless you change some things. So as I start uh, the book with from six to seven figures, which if you haven't read this yet, you've got to check it out. But in this uh, updated book, we talk about in the first page, what got you here won't get you there. So no matter if you're at 1 million, 2 million, 5 million, the path to the next level, and you're watching this because you want to get to the next level, it's going to take some things that are a little bit different than what you've probably been doing. And that's actually what the dip is about. So basically what we've got is like, you know, every single, uh, ah, shoot, I'm just learning how to, to use this. We were just joking that uh, I've got some new skills here, but like, as you get to new levels, oh, you can't even see my screen, shit. <laughs> I'm drawing here. It's your first day, Austin. That's okay. It's, it's my first day. All right, here we go. Cut and cut and restart. Yep. Power of editing. All right, so here we go. So as you get to new levels, what you've got is these dips that you've got to work through. And here uh, is like the $1 million dip. But to get to $5 million, again, you're going to have to change your approach. You're going to have to go through these hard times. So we see so many businesses get stuck here until we change this. And the dip specifically that I'm talking about here, and, and Tom and Pat chime in here because I want to I go into this for a second. The dip that we often see here is when it goes from you driving as the entrepreneur, you're driving so many of the decisions yourself to get to here. You need to be having other leaders make the decisions and drive the, each, each of the departments. And we always talk about you, you know, the value chain. So we've got marketing, we've got sales, and we've got fulfillment. And we'll come back to this in, in just a second. But what we need to do is to start to put those leaders in place. But having others start to make decisions and work through that time of getting up to speed and learning the like what works and what doesn't in the same way, like you can't continue to scale with you making all the decisions. So we need to put the other leaders in place. But that's a transition, right? That's not easy to do. So Tom Pat, what are you guys seeing with this dip that we often see where, where a lot of businesses get stuck until they can have the true other leaders leading these other departments? Yeah. Yeah. Let me hop in first. So I just want to reiterate what you said, like what got you here won't get you there. And the, the first thing I see with entrepreneurs at this level is are they aware and do they acknowledge the dip in what season they're in? Because without doing that, we often then try to work harder and just do more of what we did in the past. But what we realize is that when we're in that season, now we can take a step back and say, all right, how do I have to think and, and who do I need to be to get to that next level? Because often what we're doing is we're operating at the level we're at. And we often talk about you can't grow further than, than your mindset and your leadership. So mm. really the first step here is like, are you aware of that? And then from there, we start looking at what are the characteristics? How do we got to show up? Um, to then make some of those shifts to get to that next level. Mm, that's such an important part. The additional piece of the dip that I didn't mention there is exactly what you mentioned is like your business will never exceed where you're at as the leader. Like if you have like major limiting beliefs, if you have uh, 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 like big money concern, whatever it is that's really uh, potentially holding you back, maybe you'll have like a little spike that gets you past that, but ultimately you'll come back to your equilibrium or you'll make different decisions or you won't let go of certain things or whatever. You'll you pull yourself back. So not only developing other leaders, but you yourself have to develop as well. I think it's a huge additional uh, point to make. It, it, it's, it's hard because what you used to get rewarded for, you now get penalized for. So as you start going, well, I did this, everything happened my way. And now that got me to seven figures, which is an achievement in itself. Like your top 4% of businesses each year, like it's a great job. But I think a lot of people with that mindset, because now they start getting penalized and they also get decision fatigue. Like the, it's so hard to be always on or like you get wired. And so you start getting disassociated with your business a lot of the times and start going, well, I forgot why I love my business. I forget where we're going because now I'm not growing. It's hard work. I'm exhausted. 
no one can seem to do what I want them to do so easily. And that's because they're, they're not adapting. And so that, that change, they need to realign their vision and understand, okay, we're moving to the next level. So it's worth it. I love what you always say, Austin, about when you're buried in the day to day, it's hard to stay in love with your business because you forget why you're doing it in the first place. You forget it's just part of a bigger vision that's driving you. And it's so easy then to get buried again where you are that you don't start driving forward again and you don't make those changes. So you've got to like, you got to have that alignment. I also find a lot of people have multiple businesses inside their seven figure business, mm. which then makes it very, very hard to get people in because then it comes back to that. Well, I'm the key person risk. I'm the bottleneck because I have to make the decisions because I'm the only one that knows everything. Yeah. So it's like, you have to almost sometimes take a step back and look at that strategy and go, well, where do I need to simplify so other people can start making decisions and get them right 80% of the time. And so there, there's a big, it's a big shake up. Like you get to that point, high five, and then it's like, okay, now I'll go shake things up again. And that's, uh, that's a hard thing to do. It's not simple. Absolutely. It's simple. Absolutely. It's not easy. Absolutely. Let's come over to this, um, uh, to ne the next piece related to that, which is um, let's just map out here the uh, value chain. And this is, uh, again, one of our fundamental uh, uh, frameworks that we help guide business owners all across the globe on. So we've got marketing, we've got sales, and we've got fulfillment. This is your customer journey in essence. Let's keep things really, really simple. Now at the beginning of your business, uh, so much of, of, of things are built around you. Like to get to that 500K mark, you've got different team members where everything's really surrounded around you. There's no real org chart. And then you start to build an org chart, but you're still driving most of the results or, or at least strategy or pushing from marketing sales fulfillment to get to the next level. As we're talking about, you have to be removed from these so that you're actually working on the business. And I know my drawing's not making a lot of sense here, but uh, just think of yourself going from around you to truly working on the business in just one role as CEO. To get to that 5 million mark, this is where you've got to be, right? Not be a, a, in the day-to-day -day driving those. And what we talk about to get to at least that $2 million mark is there's two responsibilities, two manager roles that you can have. Number one is a CEO role and maybe one other, but to get to that 5 million mark, you've got to get rid of that second one and just have one. Let me come back here and show you, uh, I'm going to focus just on one piece here, and that is related to the next thing that I want to go into. This is one of your favorite things in the world, Pat, which is, you know what I'm going to say? Uh, mojitos. It's mojitos <laughs> and numbers. At the end yes. of the day, the path to the next level always comes back to the numbers. It doesn't matter if you're at 500K, 2 million, 5 million, 10 million. What we want to do is want to understand what your success formula is. Again, this is what something that we talk about in the book and with our private clients. So, so definitely understand what the success formula is, but you need to understand what your success formula uh, uh, is. So what are the key metrics that matter most and where are those at right now for marketing? Same thing for sales and same thing for fulfillment. What we want to do first is we want to ultimately understand what those numbers are. We talk about having clarity first. Then we want consistency. And then uh, we want uh, you to get a fully free. And then last but not least is we want to grow these numbers. So imagine if you know your numbers inside and out for marketing and you have just absolute clarity and then you make them very, very consistent and predictable. And it's just like, just humming. Like you just know you go to sleep and you just know a lot of good qualified leads are gonna show up. And then you get fully removed from that, that you know that they're going to be consistent and predictable without you and your time and your muscle and grit. And then you get to get to the next point where they're actually growing consistently and controllably. If you can do this for marketing, for sales and fulfillment, this is how you have that limitless business that we talk about, limitless growth through operational excellence. This is what you want to do, all right? So it comes back to the numbers. So the cool thing about this is, as you start to attack each one of these individually, because like if you look at your business as a whole, it's overwhelming. Like, where do you start? What do you focus on? What do you fix? It, it, it's, it's a big question. It's, it's like, we don't have enough time. But if we get really, really clear up like, oh, wow, within marketing, this one particular number is our bottleneck. This is off. Well, let's go and attack that. Well, that makes it much more clear and easy to, to address. And the cool thing about this value chain is it doesn't add up incrementally. It adds up exponentially once we start to unlock the numbers, only if we're working through this order that I'm talking about here, starting with getting things uh, clear, consistent, get you free, and then ultimately growing from there. 
All right. So uh, any any business ultimately comes back to the numbers. And if we improve these numbers again, we're going to see the numbers uh, or the, the uh, revenue and profit numbers improve exponentially as well. Yeah, definitely. Something in here is that because a lot of seven figure business owners, like you've hit a million dollars early, early seven figures, they will have some concept of numbers, to, especially getting up to a to, to million dollars. But what we want to do is have a really clear path of the numbers. So a lot of people, when I talk to them, they'll say, yeah, yeah, I'm pretty decent with the numbers, but I'm not sure, like, I don't really understand them. So they might be tracking some numbers. Then we go, well, I know how many sales I made. I know what revenue came in. I know uh, how many leads I got. But the big transition now is not just tracking the numbers, because if you track the numbers, but you don't really understand them, sure. then like we're not doing numbers for fun. We're doing numbers because that dictates our next action. So it's now understanding the numbers. So it's the flow and how they all come together because the numbers should tell you what is the highest leverage activity we should be working on. What is optimization versus low hanging fruit? And when we look at like the close rate, so sales numbers, some two easy numbers to track in sales. If you're doing face-to-face -face sales is show up rate and close rate of people who showed up. Now, if my close rate is 50%, I can optimize the heck out of that number. And it like, it's, I might get 1%, 2%, 3% increments on, on, on little things. But if my show up rate is 20%, I don't need to be focused on close rate optimization. I need to be figuring why are people not showing up? Yep. And that I can get my show up rate from 20% to 60% of 3x to my business. Yep. And that, that's the one lever. So understanding the flow of the numbers, but then interpreting them so that you can start like setting a strategy around what should I be focused on? Yep. And that's where that, that time versus you know uh, short-term time versus your medium and long-term time. With, as a CEO of a seven-figure business, you should be focused like 10% of your time in the short term and like the rest of the time is medium term and long-term because you've yeah. got to start looking at where is my 12-month business going and now what what numbers tell me of the focus I should work on and the order. Yeah, and, and Pat, I, I love what you brought up there because what often happens as the business scales is we get to a point where uh, complexity creeps in and we don't realize it. And with the numbers, we see that a lot. Like people will be like, I got numbers, let me show you numbers. And they, and they pull up spreadsheets of all of this stuff. But what ends up happening is because there's so many numbers that it's not telling the story. So what we're looking for with this value chain is to like ultimately say like, what's the story? And then to your point, understanding like, where is the bottleneck? And, and a lot of people, once they realize the concept of the bottleneck, it's like, that's where we, we focus to get the biggest result. So to your point, if we don't realize where the bottleneck is and we're focusing on optimizing the sales rate, but that's not the problem. We're going to end up working so much harder, but the result of what we're getting isn't coming from that. So having the numbers simplified, even if we have more detailed, like we often talk about sub value chains, right? We're going to have kind of a main value chain overall, which tells us as leaders of the company where we should focus, but then we're going to expand this out and have sub value chains in each department to then optimize within there. So that simplicity is a key part when we're talking about the numbers in the value chain. Yeah, exactly. The micro value chains within each department will tell you exactly where to focus. So if you had to focus just on show up rate to, to like improve your business by 10, 20 percent, again, potentially uh, bigger numbers uh, instead of your entire business, that's going to lead to so much more success. The other thing with the numbers is it helps you from a management standpoint. Again, we talked about making the dip to where you're truly, truly uh, a business owner and working on the business. The w thing that's going to be arguably your number one tool, definitely one of your top three is the numbers because it helps give your team clarity and it helps you drive accountability. Like there's no guessing, there's no stories in the numbers. The numbers are the facts. They're the guide they're to show you what's working, what's not, where to focus, what to fix. Um, and uh, again, so much of what you guys are sharing is absolutely gold there. Um, yeah, anything else related to the numbers? Well, yeah, so a couple of things, uh, the stories, numbers versus stories. I love that. And it's the best way to start a meeting. And this is a transition every you need to make with your team is uh, everyone will start saying, hey, how's marketing this week? Let's go through marketing this month. And everyone starts with, well, it would it, stop <laughs> numbers first. Yeah. Then you can tell me the story numbers yeah. first, because the numbers are fact. Like that's just the source of truth is the numbers. And then we'll go digging from there. That's important. The other thing is, is it, uh, like transitioning as you need to transition your, your this is sort of all links together it, you'll, you'll see i think everything's going to come back to you being the bottleneck mm -hmm. um but your mindset like looking at numbers because there's a difference between delegating 
an action and a task and saying, well, that's my salesperson, I've delegated that mm -hmm. versus delegating ownership of the sales department mm -hmm. uh, or delegating ownership of fulfillment, delegating ownership of marketing or even Facebook ads or whatever, whatever it is that it is, there's a difference because when you delegate ownership, you are allowing the decision-making capa capability to come in. And that's where we need the numbers because we need to say, these are the KPIs that we're tracking. Here is the journey of these KPIs that we're tracking. And I want you to go and do that inside the business initiatives. Yep. Um, so it's important to understand that when we start, if you can't map out a clear set of numbers and say, well, here are our KPIs that lead up to our result and then delegate someone to go and own that and like make decisions and move that forward, then it's going to be uh, very, very difficult to get good talent and keep good talent. Yep, 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 absolutely. Um, love all of that. One other thing that you mentioned there was the time difference uh, of a short, medium, and long term. So the, the least successful business is spending a lot more of their time on the short term, maybe a little bit on the medium term and tiny bit on the, the long term, but a more successful business is spending a little bit of time on the short term. Like we wanna always be having that urgency and driving that short term focus, but your real money maker is the medium term. This is, these are the things that you're not going to feel right now, but three months from now, six months from now, maybe even 12 months from now, this is where you're gonna feel. This is your real money maker again to scale to the next level. And the more that you get into things, the uh, longer term will become a bigger focus as well. So uh, less on the short term is, is the whole point um, and, and more on the medium term and a little bit more on the long term because the future arrives faster than you think. Like think of like where you were six months ago and 12 months ago. Uh, maybe three years ago, a lot of people come to us and they, when we really break it down, they're like, I have the same exact problems here today that I did 12 months from now, two years from now, three years from now. Why? Because they're continuing to focus on the short term. They're not focused on fixing the source. They're not focus, focusing enough on the medium and long term. So we've got to start to make that transition. And the more that you get up in business, the more that your needle, uh, uh, needles are going to move. Like Bezos, let's go to the extreme example. Guess where he's spending his time on? 100% pretty much on the long term, right? And as you get to a bigger and bigger business, as you want to make a bigger and bigger impact, this is where you're going to go. But we're not talking about being Bezos level right now. We're talking about getting to 5 million. And that's what I'm saying, your money makers in the medium term. So just on that, like using Bezos, taking it to the extreme, he, he started on the short term. Yeah. So like he started the business, he did the bits and he did it, but he transitioned. And that's, that is the mentality. What got you here won't get you there. So it's not just going to be overnight, that's it, I'm out of the day-to-day -day because the day-to-day -day needs to happen. The short-term needs to happen. It's just not you doing it. Yep. And that's where a lot of people don't, I think a lot of people sort of lose that in translation, like where they go, oh, I'm just, I'm abdicating my responsibility. It's not abdicating. It's not bailing out on it. It's I'm going to build these systems so simply and so this is happening that I don't need to do it anymore. Yep. And now the short term is happening without me. Because if you don't, like it's, I always point it as that uh, treadmill where you're on this treadmill, which means that you're not bringing the medium term into the short term. Mm -hmm. So you have to be, even if you're planting seeds and you transition your time from short term to short term to short term to short term to Bezos, yep. that's what you need to do. It's a transition over time, not an instant gratification that's just going to go, that's it, I blinked. And yeah. I, you got to implement, like implementing that's, is everything. Here. That's such, such a good point. Uh, Cause a lot of people are either so short-term focused or they're in the clouds, long-term focused. Yeah, yeah, they're yeah. like talking about billions before they're making, you know, 10,000 a month or whatever it yeah, is. Like, worried it's like, about problems that aren't a problem yet. Yeah. yeah, exactly. We have to work through those phases, which is, which is super good. Uh, next thing that I want to talk about is, um, uh, as always, it always, always comes back to some key frameworks. This is one of our uh, key frameworks, and I want to walk you through it now because it'll lead to the exact uh, level that you're at. Again, no matter if you're at a million right now, you're at three million, five million, whatever the numbers are. So the first level of this uh, is your strategy. What we need is an elite uh, a foundation and strategy and model set to scale. From there, we need an operational machine. From there, we drive exponential growth. Okay, so no matter where you're at, the big question is, let's say that you're at, at, at you know, uh, 1.5 million right now, you want to get to, to 5 million in the next 18 months. The first question is, is do you have a $5 million strategy? Like, is it really, really clear? And is it at that caliber? And then same thing for the operational machine. Is your operational machine at a $5 million caliber? And then from there, 
is your exponential growth at a $5 million caliber, all right? We're, we're, the reason why, you know, companies called 2X is like, we're always trying to double with where we're at so that we can always have this tangible piece of like what's right in front of us, but always comes back to this because a lot of times, you know, we'll, we'll have, uh, uh, for instance, a strategy and plan of how we can get to the next level, but like we don't build the operational machine. We don't have the operations and team in place or the time so that like, even though we keep trying to drive growth, we're not actually achieving that because we have this limiting factor of the operational machine. So it's, it comes back to where are you at? What's your limiting uh, uh, factor in working on business in the right order? This is really, really important. Starts with elite foundation of strategy, then operational machine, then exponential growth, no matter where you're at in business. And we always come back to this ourselves, right? We always come back to this uh, and, and work through these same exact frameworks. Yeah, and uh, so, so building on that, we had a, a business owner we worked with recently who, as he was progressing to the next level, said, you know, wow, I didn't even know that was possible. And it was such an interesting thing that we dove into a little bit more because oftentimes, like what we talked about earlier, is we're limited by, by what we see as possible. And very often when we're going and we're just in the business and we're focusing on that short term, we can't even see what that, you know, $5 million business looks like. And so that's why I so much love the value chain and everything we bring it back to, because when we first map out on paper, what's possible and then what's required to get there, then it simply becomes down to, all right, like one of my favorite questions that I've always asked is like, what needs to be true? So when we're clear on what we want to achieve and when we truly believe that we can do it, then it's simply a question of like, what needs to be true? And we can bring it back to the value chain. And Pat, just like you said, like, who are the people that we need to have in place? What are the numbers that they're responsible for? So we're delegating the responsibility and not the individual tasks. And that helps eliminate the decision fatigue that you talked about earlier. So, so much of what I find here is that, Austin, to your point, when we can map that out, now putting together what we need to do to get there becomes so much easier. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the, the strategy, this, there's a couple of things I, uh, I always harp on with strategy especially once you get to a million dollars. And I see a lot of businesses doing less than a million dollars they get buried in the three business strategy, which is like, I don't have one business doing X amount of revenue, a million dollars in revenue. I've got three individual businesses. They may be similar, but they're different. Mm -hmm. They're not like when you talk about uh, the your product stack and our value ascension chain, all those sorts of things like that. Do your products line up and serve the same person and take them to maximize lifetime value of a single client? which is the simplest, most direct path to any revenue level, or is it all over the place? So, so, so whenever really something- important. Let me explain this real quick so that everybody understands this, because this is really important. So it, what, what Pat's talking about is if you have multiple products, so a lot of people will have, for instance, a lower ticket digital course, for instance, and that goes to a higher ticket item, that goes to a higher ticket item. What we find is like the, the person that will buy each of those three different levels in that example are oftentimes different. So if you have a different ideal target audience, which if you don't know what that is, you've got to read the book. Like that's one of the, the first cut, uh, questions of business. So if you have different customers and you have different products, that's different businesses. And so many times people have uh, what, what Pat's talking about is have multiple businesses baked into one. We think it's one, but it, you, it's hard enough to grow one business, let alone, let alone to grow multiple in one. So that's what he's talking about. Multiple products with uh, multiple um, um, uh, uh, target customers. And it can be small. Yeah. To give you an example, one of my businesses, which was a seven-figure business, I was high-fiving myself, but I mean, I don't want to take it any further because it's hard. Like, yeah. this is stressful. And I even had the same ideal target audience, but I had two completely different products. One was a digital marketing thing. One was a referral program. It's like, this is too hard. And because they weren't stacked. They weren't fixing one problem, then fixing the other one, or upsells, downsells, cross-sells off the main core offering. So what is the core offering and then double down on that? And you can do different income stream valuations and things like that to figure out which one you should double down on. But something that you also need to do is start being critical of yourself, like ask yourself tough questions, and which is taking extreme ownership of everything in your business to steal Jocko's line. So I hear a lot of people, a good example of this is, well, I miss high, like that person, I had to let them go, they're not an A player, it's their fault. Like, well, you hired them. So did you mishire them? Is it a mishire? Did we just not get the right person? Or did you not set them up for success? Mm. So when you start looking at it from that lens, it's like, well, okay, I mishired them. Why? Because I don't have a good hiring system in place. Great, we fixed that. If it's if it's the right person, but we didn't set them up for success, why? And a lot of the time it's because the strategy is too complicated and we're expecting to, we're looking for unicorns that can replace us. 
And you've got to remember, if you took a business to seven figures, you, you know that business inside and out. Mm. So you have this assumed knowledge that you're, everyone knows that coming in. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, how do I just guarantee success here? How do I make this strategy so simple that I don't need a unicorn mm -hmm. and I don't need a unicorn to stay with us forever? Like I, Because you're putting key person risk into the business. How can I make it so simple that we can't fail and I can find A players and just get this business humming and pulsing on the way to massive growth? So your strategy, quite often the strategy is just too complicated and simplifying it down means just going back to the value chain. All I need is 100 leads, converting at this, generating this much revenue, and I'm at $5 million. Yep. It's not as sexy and it's not as complicated. And when you're at a barbecue or a grill out and you're telling people how complicated things are, you don't seem as smart, but you've got a lot more money in the bank. Mm, 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 mm. Yeah, choose what you want there. And, and, and... What we're talking about is like the key to everything um, uh, comes back to a couple things. And one of those key things is having the operational machine. So as soon as you have the machine in place where things are consistent, predictable, you can see them as far as from a numbers and system standpoint, uh, and you've got other people running them, then you just stack on new levers one at a time. So this is what happens uh, uh, so many times is people start to stack on new marketing channels and they go from one to three million, right? Or they add on a new uh, a product line and they go from two to five million, whatever it is. But only you only have the time and the capacity and the focus and the ability to do that once what you do have is a consistent, predictable machine. So systems are your key, but the operational machine as a whole will give you everything that you want. As you're talking about, Pat, you can drive growth to the next level. You can take a step back and go on a dang vacation. You could, uh, uh, you know, work 10 hours a week. You could, um, uh, you know, work less than that and put a full business owner in place. You could start to increase your cash flow and profit margin. You can do whatever. You have that flexibility, and that flexibility is that uh, something that few business owners actually get. That's all on the other side of the machine. So no matter where you're at, if you're not at that machine level just yet, that's your focus for the next six months, especially as you try to get to, to, to that $5 million plus mark is you need to um, uh, do that. And it may take 12 months. It may take three months, depending on where you're at, but we really got to have that focus. But as soon as you get there, you are in the power position to choose what you want to do next. And that's something that's really, really special. Yeah, Pat, and what I loved about, you know, some of this conversation we've been having is like, the one businesses versus the three business. And Austin, you were even talking about like being able to add on, you know, new products or whatever else. When we do this all around a single person, what we end up doing is ultimately increasing the lifetime value. And a huge thing that, you know, seven figure and, you know, those $5 million businesses often do is they're maximizing that LTV. Because without that, what we end up doing, and, and this is where so many businesses end up running into issues is they're like, I just need more leads. I just need more clients. And that ends up adding more complexity to the business. Some of the best businesses at 5 million, 10 million are the ones that are like, how do I just better refine this ideal customer? How do I serve them better, keep them longer? And not only do we create raving fans, better success stories, referrals, everything else that comes from that, but it ultimately makes the business a lot simpler because we're just serving and we've simplified down what we need to do to serve that one avatar. Yep. 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 Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, yeah, LTV is, is one of the single best levers that every business can, can maximize. And we find so much golden opportunity uh, 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 in that one channel alone uh, to see how we can keep clients longer, have them paying more, have them buy more. Uh, because the, the saying goes, whoever can pay the most to acquire a customer wins. So if your customers are worth, let's say $20,000 and all of your competitors aren't great at maximizing LTV and theirs are worth like eight to ten thousand dollars, well, you're going to be in the power position to be able to spend exponentially more from a marketing and acquisition standpoint, from a team standpoint, yada yada, uh, to to really create that. So, creating growth always for us begins with fulfillment, and that uh, begins with um, not only the right strategy, but uh, uh, keeping customers for a long time and maximizing that value. So, any other major thoughts that stand out for you guys? We've talked about strategy. We've talked about the order of things. We talked about you know getting free from the weeds. We talked about uh, maximizing LTV. Uh, anything uh, in the operational machine, anything else that stands out? One thing with LTV is uh, there's a number of ways to impact LTV. So, do, so something I do, you guys know this, but for the video, I have a, just here on my laptop, uh, I have a, a label that says, what would a hundred million dollar CEO do? Mm. And so you need to make time to go and think about this stuff. And if you don't have like two hours to be able to go out and make some thinking time to think about your strategy, 
then there's a massive problem. Step one, you need to go and free up some time uh, because you need to be able to think like a $100 million CEO to make these strategies. Like think like a $5 million CEO. Yeah. So increasing your LTV can come like in two basic things, which is like increasing your average order value. So the first time someone comes in and buys, how can we increase that revenue there and then? And then also how can we get like repeat business, additional business further down the track? So increasing your average order value, when we talk about strategy, there are lots of elements to strategy. And when we talk about, again, go and get the book because this is detailed out uh, significantly, but model one. So are we selling to five questions? Are we selling to the right people, the right products at the right price with the right positioning in a way that can scale? So when we talk about strategy, it doesn't just have to be, I think a lot of like strategy is a term that get kicks around, kicked around more than a football. So you need to start looking at each of those elements and say, well, how do I just increase the price? Like, am I focused so much on the deliverables and not enough on the value? Could I double the price of my product, reposition it, double the price? And if I'm a $500,000 business, I'm now a million dollar business overnight. If I'm a million dollar business, I'm now a $2 million business overnight. And not only doubling the price, like if you're just increasing the price, one of your most expensive things is your CAC and your team. You're like your client acquisition cost in your team. You didn't double the cost of them. So you probably quadrupled your profit. Yep. So it's like how they're the levers and that's the strategy stuff that we want to sort of get into the weeds of a little bit. That's where you should be spending some time going. If I add one more thing, if I add a guarantee that benefits this big upside, little downside, if I can reposition this, if I relook at my sales positioning, if I get people 80% sold before they get on a sales call, so I'm not just haggling over price what impact would that have on my average order value and then my LTV? Yep. So we don't have to go and just create a new product that we're bolting onto the end. There is always, always, always low hanging fruit that we can attack straight up. So think about those sort of questions when you have some thinking time. If I had to double the price tomorrow, what would I do to achieve it yep. without increasing and, and, the team? And, and, and go back to Tom's question that, that he shared earlier is like, what would need to be true? to be mm -hmm. able to double your price? Like what would you need to change from a positioning standpoint or delivery standpoint without doubling the cost? Um, because that's what we see time in and time out. If we increase the uh, uh, top line, but we do so through operational excellence and the right strategy, the bottom line grows even uh, much more exponentially on, on, on top of that. So I absolutely love that. And the cool thing is like, we see this day in and day out is like we see from the outside eye, so oftentimes what the business owners don't see, right? So this is how so many of our clients grow and grow really fast um, is because we're able to see the levers that they should be pulling. We're able to simplify things down, free up capacity and work through this order one by one. All right, so that's it for this session. Uh, we appreciate you watching and let us know what questions you've got. We've got a ton more resources out there available for you. So uh, subscribe to our YouTube channel, comment below, let us know that you like this video and what specific things you're taking away because that helps us create more content for you in the future. And also don't forget, get the book. We can give it out to you for free uh, on our website. So check that out. This is going to go into a lot of the principles that we talked about as well. And we are here to help you take your business to the next level through operational excellence. So uh, check out more of the resources and we look forward to seeing you in the next video. Cheers.